I've got a new fuel that's zero carbon. It could, it could fix the world's problems, I believe. I've, I've contacted thousands of people who will not reply back to me. The government should be replying to me. Some funds are called green funds. They don't even take it up. It's not on their radar. Oh, a, a green fuel with no carbon to start with? Oh, we can't pigeonhole that. We don't know what, 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 do, you, what do we do with it? You invest in it and make it happen. To me, it's simple logic. I, I, just, I just don't understand. My name is Roger Gordon. I'm one of a group of scientists and we hold the patent for the world's only zero carbon fuel. It costs less than gas and diesel. It's about 30 cents a litre right now. Uh, the fuel runs every kind of vehicle, trucks, cars, uh, jets, planes, big trucks. I do my normal day-to-day -day job and then I try to get this fuel going as a sideline. So if I work my 50 or 60 hours a week at my normal job, then I work another 20 or 30 hours a week trying to get the green NH3 moving, as do other scientists. We've got scientists from all the top universities in North America that continually phone me and say, Roger, I haven't talked to you for a month. Says, uh, what's changed? And nothing has changed in a month. It gets so aggravating that I have nothing to tell them, and it's a month or two months since we've talked. They seem to think that this is going to happen overnight. Well, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen, but it's, it's, it's going to be a slow process. And I keep coming back to the politicians because they have the power. They, they, with one swipe of a pen, this could be actually going tomorrow. We could be making fuel, we could be making machines, and we can't get a reply from all these people in the power. We, we more or less tripped over the idea for this machine and it took us uh, about nine years to come up with a machine from say 2000 to 2009. When we got the first machine working, I remember the day we got the first test. We, uh, you just use a litmus test for ammonia, there's the ammonia. Bang, we had ammonia, so we knew we had it. Just like a refrigerator, all the parts in this machine aren't much different than a refrigerator full of equipment. Like, your refrigerator is empty, but in this case, the refrigerator would be full of pieces. The, the things that are in this machine are mostly pipes and vessels and computerization that, that opens and closes solenoids at the right time. And it's a very simple process, really. It's just, it's, it's pressure and heat. Repair would just be like a computer repair person. They just have to go in, okay, here's the bad part, swap it out. The computer on the machine will tell you which part needs to be replaced. You need a source of energy to run the machines. That's, that's obviously something doesn't run without an energy input. We're not actually creating energy. We're just sorting molecules. So if, if I told you that you could make fuel from golf balls and basketballs, in a, I give you a box of with ball, golf balls and basketballs, all you have to do is sort them in a screen and it's very, it would be very easy to sort large, large basketballs from small balls. So that's all we're doing is we're sorting molecules. Then we put those molecules back together in it, like we're taking the hydrogen from water and the nitrogen from air, putting them back together as a new molecule of NH3 and suddenly you have fuel. So we're not breaking any laws of thermodynamics. People say, oh, well, you're not creating energy. No, we're not creating energy. You can't create energy. Energy is there already. You just have to be able to grab it. You see the wind blowing, you know there's energy. You see the sun shining, you know there's energy. In Hawaii, they've contacted me in Hawaii. There's lava flowing in Hawaii. That lava is just full of energy. So people in Hawaii have figured out that they're going to put chillers there in reverse and extract that heat into energy and now they have electricity there. The electricity runs our machine, our machine fills a, a barge full of uh, fuel, they've got free fuel. Well not free but very low cost fuel. The, if you see, uh, when you see the waves moving, there's energy, you just have to grab that energy. Make it into fuel, you've got fuel. You got a machine, you got a windmill, and you got a fuel tank. He says, and that's all you need? I said, yep. It's like propane. In a tank, it's under pressure, it doesn't evaporate. If you open it, it vaporizes off. So just like propane, only it's got no carbon. And in the vehicle, it runs completely clean. If you run propane in a vehicle, you'll find that it's cleaner than running diesel. And this, and this is the ultra because it's got no carbon. That When you take the engine apart after 100,000 miles, it's completely clean the way it was built. The NH3 uh, combustion formula is right there. So actually, for four parts of NH3 going in, you get six parts of water out. So the people from the desert were talking about, well, this would be a great way to do electricity in the desert because we're going to get water out as a, as a benefit. They said we'd get a couple thousand gallons of water. Two thousand gallons of water in the desert is worth more than the price of the fuel. Let's talk about the scalability. So you started with 
a machine that you can essentially put on your table. Uh, it looks like a small fridge. It's it's yep. very it's very compact. Yep. To and that produced said a liter every hour. About that, yeah. About t maybe twenty liters a day. Yeah. So if you upscale that, how big do you want to see these machines? What's the percentage of liter you expect they would produce? We suggest to build a fridge, refrigerator sized machines that would create 500 liters a day. Just like a refrigerator, if, if something breaks in this machine, we want to have it portable. It'll have wheels and just rolled in, rolled out. And that's our idea is to have, uh, let's say this mine in the far north, they might have 50 machines. And they'll have spares there and they'll have people there to fix them. And so they'll make their own fuel. They'll have their wind machines running. Maybe the wind machine breaks down, they have to repair that. They'll have to have people to repair that. All these people, these are all jobs we're talking about that don't exist today. So above and beyond the oil business, thousands and thousands of jobs. We, our consultant predicts 100,000 jobs in North America from this within five years after we, after we break out.